And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the upcoming Parcelings, the deck building RPG all about words and the, and the words we use. The one and only Leo Chung. How are you doing today, man? Good. How are you, man? I, it's a pleasure to be here. I am. Do <laughs> I am doing good. It's um. Um. Well, the fall weather hasn't quite kicked in, but it's at least somewhat cooler in the fact that I can go out. I can go outside without dying. Plus, it was nice and cloudy, so I didn't, I didn't have to wear my sunglasses. Fair, fair. It's nice and cold down here in Australia, and we're getting slightly warmer. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I forgot you're in you're in um upside down land. So in a few Absolutely. months, when I start complaining about the when I start complaining about the cold, you're gonna be complaining about the heat. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> it gets pretty hot down here these days. Yeah. Um. All these I'm, years, I should say. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Um. I'm not one for heat. I, I had I had enough experience of it once be, being in Arizona for a week, and I thought I was stepping into Mordor. <laughs> Just because constant sun, constant dry heat, I felt like it's like being in an oven. <laughs> mm, mm. I, I definitely can understand. I'm I'm much I prefer the cold because all you have to do is you just have to rug up, get warm. Oh, I like the cold because you know you can always put on more than you can take off. Exactly. And I mean, I, I don't know if you start peeling your skin, but that's not exactly a pleasant experience. <laughs> do I look? Do I look like I starred a David Cronenberg movie? I don't know. I've never seen you, but yeah, I get, I understand. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I think. And the only reason I bring up that is I was way too young to see The Fly. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure we all were. Mm, mm, mm. But. Um, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick for you? Well, my first introduction to role-playing games was through um, a group called Cardians. They ran World of Darkness, and it was a really fun period of time because I was learning how to do art then my friends were doing learning how to do art with me and we had an amazing gm well gms and they sort of i guess inspired what tabletops could be like for me mm -hmm. um world of darkness was very free liberal and you could do almost anything with the system within limits of course yeah um, especially <laughs> since world of Dar world of darkness and its many 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 subdivisions are very rooted within their setting. Mm, exactly. And I guess that's what made it for me. Um, mm -hmm. It was a great group. And eventually I went to moderate and help other G train other GMs up um, to pl um, tell the game or tell stories. And mm -hmm. it's just been a community that I've always been piggybacking off of, um, of my connections from. Because a lot of them are really amazing artists or they've gone into other creative fields and it's been good to keep up with them. <laughs> Now, when it come now, um, let me get the obvious joke out of the way. How many pounds of ten ciders did you have? I don't drink, actually. <laughs> but I did what's the joke? <laughs> All good. Um, no, I'm. I mean, when it, I mean when it came to pounds of dice, like every Shadowrun player has ten oh, pounds right, of right. six-sided dice. Um, I've got a big jar full. Um, probably about the size of my fist, which isn't too bit bad. But mostly the D tens, which is nice. Yeah. Um, um <laughs> at the very least, they're better. At the very least, they're better looking D tens than the ones that were in that exalted board game. Yeah, still, I got the. Yeah. Those are still the ugliest D tens I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're nice and pretty. They're just the Chessex ones, so they're just transparent ones. Nice and simple. Oh yeah, Chessex put Chessex puts in good puts in good stuff, and plus, 
you can ease you can easily be set for just about any RPG by do, by getting that um, pound of dice um, gimmick that they have. <laughs> Pretty much. Pretty much. You're getting in, you're getting enough dice for just about just about any just about anything for like um tw for like twenty bucks US. Oh. Man, I... <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I can um, I can understand having enough dice um, having enough dice to share for the uh, an entire table and a half. Yeah. Um. For and for the record, I um. I was as an aside, I was look I was looking to see if I could find an image to share of the um, of those exalted board game D10s, and um, I don't think I exaggerate when I sit when I say that these are the that these are ugly as sin. Mm -hmm. Let me show. Let me show you those. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, they did not think through the color scheme. <laughs> nah. they're they're interesting. Definitely interesting choices. Yeah, some. Um, well, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that whoever th whoever thought of um. Whoever whoever thought building the Tower of Pisa on wet soil had an interesting idea. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I mean it's tilted at the very least. Is yeah. it tilting? <laughs> and um, that's the that's the reason why it that's the reason why it's tilted is because the foundation the foundation was built on wet soil, and by the time by the time they figured that out, it was too late. It was like, mm. well, we got too far, and we may as well just finish the thing. <laughs> well, they had to because because um, if they t if they uh, took it if the amount of money that it would cause them to take it apart would have blown their budget. Is so it, was is it, it, it <laughs> tilting at more each year, or is it just stable? I don't know. I think I think it I think it's like a full like a um less less than an inch every year. Mm. There has been talk about tr about trying to stabilize it. Trying, yeah, trying to stabilize it so it do so it doesn't so it doesn't collapse uh, in mm. a few in a few years. Not that it's that close to collapse, but it's one of those things where it's going to be a slow build, and unfortunately, you can't ha we can't have Superman come in and l and have the thing lean, um, <laughs> like in that running gag in Superman two. <laughs> um now when it comes to parcelings um was your background as an artist was that the main thing that you drew from when it came to the idea and where did the spark for the idea of a word-based rpg come from honestly it was um i think it happened when my wife and i well my now wife and I were just in the cinema, and we were just talking. We just start, had started reading um, Brandon Sanderson books, and we were like, "What kind of magic system could we create that was interesting?" And we were also kind of tired of the lone wolf and player, so we kind of thought, "What we could do to try and force people, or encourage, I should say, um, people to work together a bit more." And then we started talking about how maybe powers would activate together when in contact with each other. So you would always have to be with someone. And I guess that's where the idea started. Um, it was interesting, and it, we kind of continued to develop it from there. Um, originally, we did play a lot of it on a World of Darkness system, but we found it a little bit lacking. And then at the start of 2019, I went ahead and made a card-based system. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's where it started, and it's just been something that has been pulling on all of my experiences, all of my tastes, all of, I guess, my aesthetics over the years, and compiling it into one sort of big creation. So it's, I, I guess it's sort of my debut as an artist and as a creator. And what I find, what I find kind of interesting within within the, within that setup is the is the is the fa is the fact that um well for for one you 
mentioned Sanderson as an inspiration, and incidentally, I want to find out whatever drugs he's on. <laughs> just, be, just because he's that guy is nuts. He's got a good mind. He's got a good mind, and he. I wish he would finish one series at a time, but he does them all at once, so it's interesting. Well, the his his uh, his output is insane. Oh, uh, and that's putting aside the fact that in, including including his art, his um output, he teaches at Brigham Young University and um plays Magic the Gathering with his students. <laughs> I wonder oh, if he's got. Actually, sli- I wonder if he has cool. sliver decks banned like I do at my table. God, who knows? Who knows? Maybe you should visit one day. <laughs> uh, Utah is a little bit too warm for my taste. Shame. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Now, when it comes to when it came to the card based approach, what did like you had mentioned, um, you had mentioned it sounds like this start that um, some of the early concepts of parceling started out as a um, world of darkness That's... hack. Um, yeah. Now I ha- I do have to ask when now you've mentioned world of darkness as inspiration, but were there were there any um, specific um, lines in in world of darkness that were a big that were bigger influences than others? Like a lot, um, like a lot of times when somebody mentions World of Darkness, it's shorthand for a vampire. Is it a, was Mage I, a influence? I honestly played mainly hunters and geists, but I took a look at the mage system and I found it a little bit odd to use. At, at least it was very dependent on the GM, um, as in the GM would always say yes, no, maybe, and it honestly took a lot of time. Um, to do the spells when I tried it once or twice. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I guess my aim was to create something a little bit more table-friendly, where everyone gets to say in, in what happens, rather than just being half an hour on one person, half an hour on the next. Now, when it comes to... when it, Now, what was it that, what was it that prompted shifting from a dice system to a card centric system even though even though dice are used within parcelings this is ve- from what i was able to find out this is very clearly a card centric um system absolutely we really only use dice during character creations and during um i guess bookkeeping sessions mm-hmm. um predominantly we use the car we use the cards because i felt like the dice didn't really represent the characters enough they're sort of like the same you can borrow anyone's dice rather if you've got your own set deck of cards if no one really can borrow your deck of cards you, you get what i mean mm-hmm. so it makes it more personal it's sort of like you're holding your character in your hand and it's less of a luck based system where it's not you're left to the whims of lady luck rather you've got a lot of control over what happens and how it happens because you made that deck you sort of know what's in the deck and you can predict what will happen in the next draw whether it's better to take this type of action or another type of action um, um so in the end it's it's all about control i guess yeah and some the other th- that brings me to the other part of that is that Parcelings is advertised as a deck building RPG. Mm. Now, mm. a lot of times when I th- when I think about deck building, I think about the kind of deck building card games that have co- that have come around in the in the last um, in the last eight years. Um, mm. Stuff like Dominion, stuff like the um, the car- the um, family of card game systems that um, Cryptozoic has put out over the years, or even the living card game format that Fantasy Flight Games has put out. Um, oh, yeah. Were any of I, those I, influences for doing deck building, or did it just build off of what you had mentioned previously? Well, I did... I was, I still am, a big fan of Dominion. And I've got my... Uh, I've got quite quite a few sets. <laughs> and I forced a lot of people to play Dominion with me. Mm-hmm. But... 
it sort of got the idea that maybe there was something else out there. It was one of my first big um, board games that I played, and a lot of people would say that Parsing feels a little bit closer to board games um, in gameplay sometimes. But it, the idea was that it was a matter of skill when playing the game. It was a matter of your choices, the things that you you decide to put in. Um, now, while there's less of a deck building aspect during the play of game, it's all about the setup. Mm -hmm. Because each... We use regular playing cards because they're accessible, they're easy to obtain, and it creates less of a barrier of entry. But each character starts out about, with about 15 cards, um, taken from a 52-card deck. Mm -hmm. Or 54? 54. 52-card 52, um, yep. deck. And each of the suits represents a different kind of thing. Um, you've got your spades, which is sort of your communication, um, your abilities... Um, no, sorry. Spades is your ability to interpret information, your ability to retain it, your ability to understand it, the ability to think on your feet. You've got your clubs, which is your the physical interaction with the world, your strength, your brawl, and your finesse, the ability to change things in your environment physically. Mm -hmm. And then you've got your conduct, which is sort of your social ability, um, and that's sort of your ability to interact with others. Um, and these three uh, suits kind of form the crux of most interactions, uh, most mundane interactions with the world. Mm -hmm. um, the diamonds are sort of like a wild card. They, they're they all about willpower and pers um, perseverance through adversity, as well as triggering some of the more um, supernatural aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. um, but it's... It was very interesting trying to find a balance using these cards to play the game. Um, and it took a lot of experimentation, I can tell you that. <laughs> when you meant when you mentioned experimentation, what were what were some of the things that um that you had that you had considered early on but as you were developing the game didn't qu didn't quite fit and had and had to get um had to get taken out. Um, in, in terms of card mechanics, most of them still exist. They were just fine-tuned. There were a couple extra fiddly things um, regarding the parsings themselves that had to change, that had to be adapted, as well as implementing more safeguards with how the magic system works. But I don't think I've actually culled all that much from the original game. It's more refining and retuning um, the rule set. It, it's been rather fascinating because usually when I go through games, I have to cull about half of the systems. Um, but my ta I always threw rules at my table first. And then we had a discussion whether or not it was worth implementing. And if it wasn't, we just never ran it. So nothing got cut in that sense. Um, I had a very good table that was had really good head on their shoulders. <laughs> now, um, yeah. <laughs> now, when it comes to when it come, now, um, one of the one of the main th now one of the main things that that has been made clear that it that's at the core of it is um words, and mm. something I should note is that whenever I th when I think of the concept of words being ma words and language being magic in and of themselves oddly enough the um oddly enough sanderson's work wasn't wasn't what came to mind with with that it was actually um the works of ursula k Le Guin, um who uh who's responsible for the earth sea books uh i haven't actually read those books yet can you tell me a little bit about them um there's there's a bunch I could go go into because um, um Big series. She, well, she um for a, for a lot of fa for a lot of fantasy authors, she's kind, she Le Guin's work is kind of is kind of in the second is kind of in the second place. There was a sci-fi miniseries, but that's um not well liked and Le Guin has publicly disowned it. Um but the <laughs> core thing that I, the core thing that I want to focus on is the concept of true naming. 
Mm. Like she's she's credited as being as being at the forefront when it comes to that in um, fan, in fantasy fiction. Mm, mm. Name, namely that there's the names that everybody has, and then there's the true name that um, that if you that can be that can be used to contr- to have control over something. It's definitely a is definitely a very um, fey kind of thing. Mm. Um. And I, yeah, because and because of the, and because of the, and even with that, there's some, um, there's con- there's consequences when it comes to use when it comes to using that st- that style of magic. Okay, that's quite interesting. Um, the words that we use in parsings, uh, mm. it was it's more linked to well, it is linked to who they are, but it's more linked to how people describe you. So someone can be cold, someone can be hot, someone can be angry, someone could be a doctor, someone could be strong or a shield, or they could be a tool. Um, we use those words to describe people all the time, for better or worse. And I think that's where I was drawing from, the identity and the fact that our own identities, who we actually are, who we try to be, has an influence on the world. Mm-hmm. So in parsings, these words um, alone, they're useless because they're contextless. They need to be put into context with another person's words. So someone might have the word cold and someone might have the word shoulder, but together, they don't, by themselves, they don't really mean much. But when they're together, what does it mean to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, cold, cold shoulder, ignor- ignoring. Yes. Now, you could... So basically, those two parsings could... Um, basically put their powers um, to work by trying to to force someone to ignore someone else. Or they could literally freeze someone's shoulder, turning it super cold, mm-hmm. or even um, turn, slick the, um, the shoulder of a road, like the little curb bit, mm-hmm. um, with ice because it's so cold. Um, it's all about how the words are interpreted in the moment. And... In that sense, identities can change, and it's it's all about it, it. The game itself is supposed to talk, but um, or at least lead people to think about how they use words and how they want to just describe things. And that's definitely that's when it when it comes to when it comes to that. You mentioned you mentioned that um you wanted to make it so that. The idea of the lone wolf character isn't um, isn't isn't advised within within this system. Um, during playtests, how many characters would you say you often see with it with as around um, a given table? Mm. Especially give especially given that kind of interplay that you're shooting for. Like, what would um, you say the average amount of players at a, at a given table, based on the playtest reports you've gotten are? Uh, most of them are four or five. Um, there's very few two-player groups, um, um, but I think the sweet spot for most GMs is about four players. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's enough variation that does appear when you have four players. Um, it makes it a lot easier to get ra- um, get around problems that the GM might throw at you. So most of my groups usually run to about six players. But that's also because I like um, pushing myself and grabbing more plays than I can handle sometimes. What, are you, I... what are you, Icarus? <laughs> I remember in my early days of GMing, I tried GMing 10 people at once. Um, it was an interesting experience. Kind of make <laughs> Never me doing that again. drink with that kind of talk. Um, it, it ran well enough because I was running both voice and text at the same time. But as I've gotten older, my concentration has dropped considerably. <laughs> um, I've I've been in I've been in um I've been in ta- I've been in conventions and the like where where there's been ten or more players at players at the table and um tip and sometimes there's been only one GM and I've seen that I've seen him have. The look, the look of the professor who hasn't left his lab in three days, or something, or something like that. And I'm just, yeah, I'm yeah. just like, I'm not doing that. 
no, no, no. Um, GMing ten people is not advised. No. Trust me, it, it's a terrible experience. You will need a, a strong drink afterwards, and maybe a couple days to recover after a session. I can tell you that. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but yeah, I'm yeah. Probably... <laughs> and I could easily, I could easily see that. I could easily see that happen. <laughs> I could easily see yeah. that happening, or or needing the or possibly needing not ju- not just a strong drink, but for somebody to bring out the keg. Oh yes. <laughs> or oh. will forgive me for referencing <laughs> beer fest. Bring out das boot. <laughs> I can say certainly that after some some sessions, I've got a headache more than I'd care for. <laughs> um, but again, it, it this game really does involve the entire table. Um, during the magic session, because everyone's got a word or got a couple words that they can contribute. So it's interesting to see how groups work together as a team. And not just in the sense that I do this action by myself, but actually have to agree to something together Mm -hmm. to do something. And when it comes, when it comes to, when it comes to the whole word based approach, um, Mm -hmm. Now of course now of course I've de- I've delved into it a bit but for the benefit of the for the benefit of the temple um walk me through how how that would um how that would wor- how that would work with it within the um within the choice system itself Okay so the way teamwork works within the puzzling or ch- the choice system is that you've got a main actor and then you've got helpers the main actor always draws um, whatever cards they need from their action, but the helpers only draw two cards. But this doesn't say that th- these two cards are not very helpful. Um, they can make or break um, break an action. So with the magic system, we've got two types of words, really. Aspects, which are nouns, and they sort of describe what's been targeted by the magic. And we've got augments, which are any kind of describing word um, that applies changes to the aspect or the target of the magic. Mm -hmm. So basically you've got your main, um, the person using the aspect saying that I want to change, or well, the team saying that we want to change this. So we're going to use um, X words. So say that you want to make a barrier. Someone's got the word shield. That's perfect. We're going to use that. And then, we start going into specifics, starting to describe what kind of shield do we want. Do we want it malleable? Do we want it hot? Do we want it cold? Do we want it strong? Do we want it to grow over time? And all these words kind of get thrown into this big pot until the table has a consensus of what kind of magic they want to perform to get out of the situation, um, whatever problem they're facing. Mm-hmm. And the GM goes ahead and tells them how powerful of a spell they need, and then all the players start drawing from their de- from their decks to try and get the exact number of successes needed as dictated by the GM. So it, it, it's sort of like a big group process, and sometimes it can take a little bit longer. But it's not like it's moments where you're not doing anything. You're always able to participate in in the talk, in the conversation about what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Which is also, going back to the lone wolf, um, it's not possible to do this kind of magic alone. And, you know, everyone likes magic. <laughs> everyone likes to eat magic. Although what, what, I think, what I think is going to, I think is going to be interesting in, for some and um, tricky for others is the fact that in the material presented um, so far, there isn't mm-hmm. the equivalent of a spell book. <laughs> No, there isn't. <laughs> like, there's bullet po- there's glorified bullet points about how about how a spell is constructed, but there mm-hmm. isn't there there isn't a um spe- there isn't a code of a codified list of spells. Which No, um, there isn't. I'd actually I'd actually say that having that kind of thing in this case would be um counterproductive. I reckon so. Um again, this game's meant to stimulate your thinking process as well as your ability to rationalize and your ability to come to a consensus with your peers 
So having this spell book opens up a lot of problems because I know a lot of GMs have trouble when I go in and I've tried D and D and then I've come up with all these other utility based um, effects on the spells based on the text. But then we get into an hour of debate whether or not that's acceptable or not, and then other people, other players start pitching in, and it becomes a whole bunch of rule mongering. I, I wanted to cut that out, and I wanted to give both the players and GMs more power, and have a discussion, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and within within the. Within the, within that within that kind of thing, um, now obvi obviously when it comes to magic systems, there's always there's always some kind there's always some kind of catch. Um, I remember in Mage they had the uh, rules for paradox, um, and in so in a lot of other cases there's usually there's usually some resource or, or the like. Um, what would you say the catch is when it comes to words? Mm. Some sometimes it's a case of a sometimes it's a case of a resource. Sometimes it's a case of a risk of backlash. So there is both a resource for people to use um, to cast the spell and also the backlash. So I guess when I originally concepted the idea, the parses were so like wishes, wishes of how you'd like the world to be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes wishes turn sour. Sometimes they hurt you in ways that you don't expect. Um, so I suppose it's up to the team to dis to define the spells well enough that they don't backlash too badly. And also, um, I guess they can cause physical backlash as the world itself rejects your idea. Um, in in the case of where you don't get enough successes, mm -hmm. um, so I guess those are the drawbacks of using the magic system. Yep. And when it, but even even with that, I'm get I'm guessing it's a case of this is a very free form system, but it's but it's one where um where you can't where you can't just throw th you can't just throw things about and hope that something sticks. <laughs> no you cannot. Um it, it's sort of like a hard soft magic system. There's some hard rules in place, but the effects are very soft. Like there's a lot of changes and and it, it really does depend on the situation. I know some of our players have tried to throw things until they just stick and often it hasn't ended up the in ways that they're pleased with. Mm -hmm. But again, it's all about consistency on the GM's part. They need to be able to make rulings um, hard and fast and to be able to, I guess, come to a consistent approach in dealing with these issues. So like with all other systems, this places a lot of heavy, um, heavy role on the GM. Mm -hmm. um, to be able to be arbitrary and not be too swayed in the moment. Though, of course, the rule for cool always applies. Yeah. Now, when I was when I was going through it, I did see I did see the whole concept of parses as well as the as well as the concept of um, uh, paragraphs, and. <clears throat> What I'm curious about is where where would you say the line is between, um, descriptively speaking, where would you say the line is between a parse and a paragraph? So the paragraph itself is more like a community of people. If each person is a word, and a parse is maybe a sentence, mm -hmm. the paragraph is the collection of those things. It's people that have gone through and done parses time and time again. So so much that they might as well be a unit, yeah, uh, an organization, with a a shared goal, and it's sort of representing representing that when people have a direction to follow, they're stronger together. But if they're just kind of winging it all the time, they're a little bit weaker. So the paragraph itself is more like a power boost. It's more like a coven of witches. Mm -hmm. 
um, than another type of spell. It's your ability to be stronger together and embodying that fact. All right, that's that's definitely something I can um, I can go I can go along with. Um, when it comes now, when I end up looking at the um, at the ex at the Excel at the Excel character sheet, um, mm -hmm. something that I something that I f I found I found um, interesting is that there's more slots for augments than there are for aspects. Mm. Um. That was an intentional design choice mm -hmm. because the aspects themselves are very powerful words. Um, and having too many of them, you kind of fall into the trap of um, what's it? Uh, indecision, where you've got too many options. Because, say, one everyone on the team has two two aspects. Um, that means there's what in a in a normal table of three or four, you've got six or eight different um, options to target, and then you've got permutations on that based on the, all the other words that you can use to describe them. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there are multiple solutions to a problem, and sometimes there are none, um, based on the words you have. But the idea is, um, the idea was to reduce the load on the players. To reduce the number of options before they say, okay, I, we can do this this way, or we can't do this at all. It, it's the idea that you don't want to spend too long figuring out things. Um, so it, it, it was limiting in that fact. And how many times, how many words can you use to descri describe someone off the bat that are nouns? Most of the time, they're adjectives. Most of the time, the actions. Most of the time, the things that they do are doing or how they're doing it, rather than actual nouns. And I think that was the big difference. Why there's a lot less um, aspects given to people than anything else. All right, that make that um, that makes sense. And the other, now, when it comes to the card thing, something that I find interesting is. You kind of have a reversal of of value mm. when it comes to face cards. Yes. 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 A lot of a, a lot of times <laughs> within within um within these kind within these kind of games. Now, obviously, something like Saga System is its own thing because it doesn't have face cards. But mm. oftentimes, face cards in other games end up being the extra effect kind of result. Mm. Well, it it sort of plays back into the i um the number system and how it works because all cards have numbers, right? And typically, um, in most systems, um, well, most playing cards, the jacks, queens, and kings are all worth ten, like in blackjack. Um, but in this system, it's kind of the inverse. You can only use numbers up to whatever um, how many cards you and the team have drawn at the same time so mm -hmm. if you've done a check if you've done an action and you've drawn five cards but you get a six that six is not worth six points of successes it's only worth one whereas if you drew a five that's that sort of takes us full value because if you've um, drawn five cards so when I got to the face cards the 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 royal cards I had a little bit of a dilemma how much points were they worth? Were they tens or were they just um, ones? And then after some conversations with the various people, um, we decided that maybe they represented something special, something bad, something that isn't always in your deck because how often do you get to see royalty? And how often is that good for you? Um, so we kind of went with the idea of conditions. So they're sort of issues that your characters are facing at the moment um jack's been very minimal issues like i'm out of breath or i need a, i need a bit of time to rest or i'm not thinking clearly and going right up to kings where i'm missing an arm or i've got severe burns and i can't move mm -hmm. the the way they worked is that they give the gms an opportunity to throw 
little wrenches into the into the deck to cause problems, to cause issues um, for the players, to create a sense of tension, knowing that your character isn't functioning as best as they could be. Now, when it can... now um, the other thing that I I notice is the um, now even though you don't call it that, we have a kind of attribute and skill and skill setup here. Mm-hmm. Um, within within the within the system of checks. Yes. And were there were were there any instances where there where there were um. Even though now, even though they're called, um, yeah, ap, ap, even though it's image and aptitudes in this case, were there yep. were there any instances where there were cer- where there were certain ones that you felt could be um, applied to mul- applied to multiple um, images? Yes, absolutely. They're not tied at all. Mm-hmm. So you sort of pick and choose based on how you want to approach things. Say you want to make friends. Um, you could go for maybe a charm and acting check to pretend to be nice and friendly, to be pretend that um, you're interested in the same things. You could go for a cunning and acting, or well, that would be a cunning and acting, to pretend to be the, interested in the same things. Or you could go for maybe an intelligence, because you know how you should act to fit in. But a lot of these actions, they're not clearly defined on what aptitude you want to use what kind of um what kind of image you want to present to the world it, it's all about how you phrase it and how you want to achieve it um giving the gms a little bit more of a i guess a, an edge on describing the situation accurately because mm-hmm. how many times they've been told to do an acrobatic check when um when it could just be something as simple as walking up a ladder or going across the type rope. There's a lot of variation, but it really depends on how you want to do it, I guess. Yeah. Now, when it com- now, now of course, when it comes to when it comes to that, um, mm-hmm. within within um within the push image, of course, I'm lo- I'm looking mm-hmm. at both the sheet and with yep. and with the material. Um, mm-hmm. That's the, that's the one that ha- that ends up ha- that ends up having three di- three different, um, even though even though they're not ap- aptitudes in the tr- in in the sense of the of the other types, um, it mm-hmm. does ha- it does have three that I feel are important enough to on uh, note, and that's emission, embodiment, and enchantment. Could you go into yes. what the line is between those three? So those three relate to the type of pause that's happening. So they're almost specifically um, to do with magic. Um, so they're built up um, on the way that you want the magic to act. You've got your emissions, which is sort of creating something out of nothing. So if you say, if you've got um, your aspect saying a chair, but there's no chair in the room, you'd be wanting to create a chair with emissions. Mm-hmm. You've got em- um, enchantment, which says, I want to make this chair to do something. So you can make a move, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller. But basically, the enchantment's all about affecting other things. Whereas the embodiment is like the, the line of thought is, I want to be the chair. Maybe chair wasn't the best example here. But the idea that you are a chair or someone's using you as a chair, therefore the pause is applicable to you. Um. But the idea is that they kind of embody different types of magic, because not everyone's strengths will be at the same in the in the same fashion in the same way that they want to affect the world. So they they are standalone from the other aptitude, um, aptitudes because they are fundamentally different. They're used purely with the magic. Mm-hmm. Now, when it now we've dan- we've danced around the the um. Car- the card system for a bit, but I think I think it's t- I think it's time to instead of da- instead of dancing around it, jump in the pool and say swim, damn it. Um, <laughs> so obviously the f- so when go when going over how the system works, obviously the first is is declaring what you're going to be doing with your with the uh, de- with the deck, i.e. Yes. what. Now, and I'm only using these terms because out of um habit, but it's what attribute and what yep. skill? 
Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. Which is what image and aptitude pretty much are. I'm just. Yes. It's. <laughs> I wanted to be different. Yeah. And I guess I'll be. I'll, I'll always have that comparison. So we'll see. Um, we'll see. For what it, for what it's worth, you're not the only one that I make that I make that compare that comparison with. It's more of a. Um, it's more. It's more of a right hand, left hand issue. Um, yes. Um, Makes sense. Like I'm not. I'm never going to be able to catch a ball with my right hand. Yes, of course, um, of course. And that, and um, of course, after that, the GM decides the diff the um difficulty. Mm -hmm. Now, when now um, when it comes uh, when it comes to this, do you do you consider now for the benefit of this of this little thought experiment, do you consider um. Do you consider parcelings to have a sum based resolution or a success based resolution? Success based resolution. Um, so basically, the GM says you need this many success successes to succeed. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to draw the values of the correct suit. Um, so this relates back to the images or the attributes that we're using. Um, and out of the cards that you're drawing. So say that you want to punch someone. You're looking for clubs. But the interesting thing is that you've got other cards that you've drawn. You've drawn you could have drawn spades and hearts or even diamonds. Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of tell the story of how you're um, completing an action. And it gives the GMs a very nice prompt to think about how you do it. Because you can hurt someone quite brutally, quite upfront. Or you can be smart about it and aim for weak points. Or you could, you know, make use of your beauty to distract them and then sucker punch them. Mm -hmm. Or your words or whatever. But the idea is that when you are going through these checks, um, each card that you draw tells a different story. Whether it's a low number being you're taking very simple and true methods to, do, to achieve a task. Or you're taking a 10, which is like... You're going in such esoteric ways that only geniuses would understand you. Um, so again, it, it's. I think I've gone off the original question. <laughs> now, the way now um the way I've the way I've interpreted it is is as fo is as follows. Um, mm -hmm. like if you were if you were doing this, and we'll go with, I'll go with the punch one. I'll go with the punch one because um I love a good tavern fight. <laughs> yep, of course. Um, Everyone does. Especially especially or is it, or as it's also known an Irish wedding. <laughs> or is yep. it's also also known a Scottish evening. <laughs> oh god. But the um so for that that would of course that would of course be um spades. So I um, so, clubs, clubs, clubs. Yeah, clubs. What, what am I saying? Yep. So so for that I I would so for that, if I've got two and two, I would draw, I would draw I would draw um, four, four cards. Four cards, and for and for and for the purposes of this, um, any cards that I had that were that were spades, I could add their full value if the um, if the if, if you had drawn enough cards. So anything above four would become a one. But one, two, three, four would um, be, you know, take their full value. All right, that's. I think that I think that's a good net to have, since it, it means that you're with something like this. Um, you're not trying to sh you're not trying to shoot for the highest ones possible. You're trying to shoot for the highest ones that you can get away with. Mm. It was a matter of balance because otherwise everyone's, um, and also strictly speaking, um, no a numbers game because if everyone had. The decks filled with ten, nine, eight, seven, six. The numbers get awfully hard. They get awfully hard to manage, and there's not many perks of picking out low numbers. Yeah. So, I designed the system to be low number based, mm -hmm. um, to help sim to help one, um, encourage growth throughout the campaigns, or when you start building up your character, you start being able to use bigger numbers, you get stronger effects, and things get proportionally more and more epic yeah. um but also to promote the use of all the cards where possible yeah now in the, in this regard i do want to i do want to clarify the card value would um would be the equivalent of the amount of cards Successes. that you're drawing you're drawing so uh, 
Yes. Six. So, like I said, if image and aptitude in this case were two each, then card value would be would be based uh, on the number of cards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the ones, two, threes, fours take their full value, and anything above four becomes a one because they you've gone past your limits. You've gone. You've tried something that's a little bit beyond your capabilities, whether it's because you're not skilled enough in that aspect or you just don't have the body to back it up. Mm-hmm. Um. Punching above weight. Yes, exactly. It's like trying to do a simple kick or doing like a triple backflip spinning roundhouse kick. Yeah. One is definitely easier than the other. One is less likely to fuck up. The other the the um the other thing that I did that I did note with this is because of how success, critical success and botches um work. Mm -hmm. Would would it be fair to say that it's a lot harder to get those extreme results in this compared Absolutely. to other systems? Absolutely. I think in my time as GMing the system, I've only encountered two or three critical successes and maybe three or four critical failures. Because the way they work is that you need to draw, um, at least for the critical success and critical failure, you either... Um, you need to draw all of the same suit um, when you're drawing more than three cards. Mm-hmm. And since you've got, what, 15 cards in a basic deck, it's highly unlikely that you're going to get these these three perfect cards or these four perfect cards um, um, at the start of the game. But as you get hurt, your deck dimish- diminishes and diminishes and diminishes. So it becomes smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. And if you're lucky enough... This could increase your chances of getting a critical success or critical failure, but it's sort of in the lieu of a dramatic reversal or a dramatic death. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, it's it, it's it, it's a very different system to what people are used to, whether it's D and D, and you roll a one to get a critical failure or twenty to get a crit success or you just simply are getting more than five successes on a dice roll, mm-hmm. um, like as I'm um, in WAD. It becomes an interesting play on the numbers, and you can almost plan around it, around avoiding critical um, failures, because you can always spend a turn to reshuffle your deck, to return all the cards that you've used back into your deck, and which allows you to sort of avoid these mass failures or set yourself up to look like the hero if you've been card counting correctly mm-hmm. um although although um i think if you're card ca- i think if you're card counting correctly then you should then you should consider moving to vegas <laughs> exactly who had time for table dots when you could be ma- making an actual bank well well, until, uh, until the house gets mad at you for coward conning, and then you have, and then you have to spend, then you have to spend a few hours in the back. Oh, absolutely, and you may never come out of the back, <laughs> depending on the institution. But yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, some now something else within something else within the now when it comes to the derived um, stats, there are a few there are a few um, aspects of that that I that I wanted to. Um, wanted to delve into obviously something like health is self-explanatory um mm. but where, where were the importance of um th- of things like articulation and syllables come into play so articulation is sort of your ability to use your pars powers and that should naturally grow over the progression of the campaign mm-hmm. as you spend time and effort trying to improve that um, and it'll, basically, at the start of the game, you have one aspect and three augments. But as you progress, it can grow up to three augment, um, three aspects and twelve augments. And that's the natural progression of articulation. It also locks away some of the more potent powers that you can develop as a parsling, based on your understanding. So it's it, it's sort of like I, I guess it'd be akin to leveling up. When you increase your articulation, more and more things become available to you. Syllables is more or less the 
representation of mana or an energy system for your parsing. Each time you parse, you do something uh, parsing power related. You spend a point of syllables, and these are kind of de these points are derived from some of the image stats and your articulation. So it's sort of a power bank um, to say you can or can't do this. It's supposed to um, create the sense that it is a resource, it is your own personal stores of energy that you're using to change the world. Mm -hmm. Now, would it be fair to say that one of the, one of the more, um, aside from your, aside from health, one of the more important of the derived stats is going to be coherency? Absolutely. So, the idea with coherency is that um, besides d death is obviously one way of losing your character, but coherency is another. Um, so coherency is about how human you are. The higher the number, the more human you're like, the more rational you are. And the lower the coherency, the more driven by your own words, the words that people have been defining you by, the words that are tattooed onto your body start to take over um, the way you think, the way that you act. You start to become more of a caricature, caricature to, I can't say that word, caricature, um, of those words rather than an actual human being. Mm -hmm. And when it hits zero, you can your powers and character devolves into something called an incoherent. So it's basically a monster that is based around one of your words, and that becomes their core concept. Yeah. If you're lucky enough, you can still play as these characters, and if you're not, the GM takes control of your character. And it's not fun when that happens. <laughs> well, now, um, I will I will note that when I saw when I saw the descriptions for coherency, um. That was that was when I was starting to consider maybe this guy has played a few World of Darkness campaigns because oh, it's geez. not because um something like that is a is a very World of Darkness kind of thing to do um mm. like I mentioned before mages had um paradox um vampire had humanity and and so on and um of course then in exalted one of my personal favorite um games using the storyteller system there was the concept of the great curse and the different forms that it would take. Hmm. Yes, definitely a played one. I mentioned yeah. <laughs> yeah. I found that as an interesting mechanic though. Mm -hmm. More often than not, the you never actually hit zero if you play your cards right. If um, you tried <laughs> if you're I'd careful. I'd say I'd say it's somewhat e I'd say it's one of those things that really depends on how much of a dick the GM is. Mm. Um, more specifically, if they're th if they're that guy when it comes to when it comes to the paladin problem, is the paladin? Yeah. There would there have, now um I hang out on TG a lot and there and yep. there's been a lot of infamous horror stories of of really bad GMs putting players in these putting paladin players in these fall or die situations, i.e. You either you either fall and become a black guard or you lose your head. Mm. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how, with how asinine the um, the mm. alignment system works as a morality system, i.e., it doesn't and was never designed to. But it's but there's also there's um but that's wh that's why I think that. When it comes to the Great Curse, it's intended to it's intended to feel like the flaws that you'd see in um, in Greek theater, like say Hercules' mm. bouts of madness. Mm -mm. Um, the problem is that it's ultimately up to the GM as far as how strictly they're going to enforce that kind of thing. Yes. Um, that's why. I, it's it's one of those mileage may vary kind kind of things. There are certain GMs who are going to enforce it more, and there are certain ones that are going to enforce it less. Um, mm. It's, but it but um, it is one of those if you're do if you're doing it right, you sh you it's not really going to be as much of a factor compared to other things. Um, I would say that World of Darkness is a little bit easier on it than Exalted is. <laughs> but one thing that I do note with how you've got it set up is that 
coherency can go into the negatives. Yes. Um, so you still, even if you hit into negative levels of inco um, coherency, you can still sometimes retain control of your character if you happen to know your deck well enough. Um, but basically you become, as I said, a caricature of a single word. Uh, you kind of represent that word in any of its terrible and fascinating ways, and you sort of have to eat things that represent that word to survive. Mm -hmm. So, in a sense, you become, it's one way to become superpowers, because you know how in a lot of stories there's the whole revival of a character, and they're suddenly they're more powered up. This is sort of like that. Mm -hmm. But it's in exchange for a lot of your humanity. You may not even look human, or remote, be able to exist in a human society anymore but you still get to survive at least once yeah and um, um yeah <laughs> in the, in in that particular regard i'm get now the vibe that i get is that perseverance is your extra effort system hmm. so perseverance um also plays a role as a resource mm -hmm. it's the number of times in a day you can reshuffle your deck without having to spend a turn. So if you're in a high stress situation, like you're in a fight, and you don't have time to say, I want to take a turn to um, re recenter myself, you can use Perseverance to push past that. And it basically lets you reshuffle your deck so that you've got a full set of cards to draw from. Um, and it, it's, it, it is an interesting thing because sometimes players really, really hoard this resource and other people spend it like mad. But it's usually in the f um, f fight or flight situations that it really pay, um, comes into use. And I thought it was a mechanic to prevent people from running out of cards. Which I I can de I can definitely um, get behind that. Now, the last the last pillar that I want that I do that I do want to talk about is tricks. Mm. And where when it comes to tricks where do, where does where does that where, where does that particular aspect fall into the dichotomy does it is it a case of a more a more specialized usage or is it a case of something it can defeat or somewhere in the middle um so the tricks are sort of like little ways of tinkering of how your character plays um, whether it's to change the value of aces so that they do something else, because who wants to put a 1 in the deck when they could put a 2, or 3, or a 4, or even a higher number card into your deck? Um, they, some of them say, oh, hey, you've got to ace up your sleeve. Put away the ace until you need it. Or aces now become 2, or aces are always the correct suit. So they, they give a lot of um, mileage out of how you build the deck. Whereas other tricks are like, oh hey, if you're in a low key situation and you've drawn two of the same number, you can reshuffle one of those cards back into your deck and draw a new card. Mm -hmm. Or playing with your deck upside down. <laughs> what, just literally just... flip the deck over and then keep going so that everybody can see the top of it? Yes, exactly. Um, like I said, this game. Card count is almost inbuilt into it. It's such a small deck, you should be able to get a, a good, vague idea of what's in your deck at any time. And that trick that I mentioned for um, forward thinking just simply makes it easier. Um, but they also lean into special powers, unlike the ability to see the world through one of your words. Um, lens. Um, so say you were a measured person, like you've always been careful, and you used, um, if you wanted to see the world through the word measured, you could either see how reserved someone is in taking a certain action, or you could actually literally see the measurements in the world, people's height, sizes, their speed, um, yada yada yada. Um, it, it, there's a lot of customization that the tricks offer. They let you really personalize how you experience the game. And when 
And actually, now that now that I've given it more thought, maybe the better comparison I should have made was um, backgrounds. <laughs> yes. Espe especially since I know <laughs> since going through it, I noticed that some of them obviously some some of them are um, are are um, character are, creation only. Some of them are character creation only. Some of them are are um, theme are themed around are themed around certain images, and others are independent. As well as the fact that. Some of them have a specific amount of rank. Um, others are a little bit more flexible. Hmm. Um, again, I drew inspiration from various things. Mm -hmm. um, feats from D&D, &D, um, merits from World of Darkness, um, I guess backgrounds also from D&D. &D. Um, there's well, the, a lot of variation. Yeah, the, yeah? B the background thing, is, uh, as, I was meant, as, I've, uh, as I was describing it, that is... Um, from the storyteller system. Ah, okay. Sorry. Um, it, I know there's backgrounds in D and D, but I can't say that I'm a D and D um, expert because I played it once or twice, didn't end up liking it. No big loss. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so they are scaled because they each have different effects, and it's to avoid saying, "Oh, if you want to be this type of character, you have to get this." It is supposed to encourage different choices by making things more some parts more expensive. Um, I know, which is counterintuitive, but it's sort of like unlocking a level one power versus unlocking a level ten power sometimes, with the way these tricks work. Mm -hmm. So it's been one of the bigger things I've had to go through is to go through and balance these tricks. Yeah. Um, were there were there any in, were there any instances where a cer where a certain trick kind of I'm not going to say broke the game but leaned a little bit too close to bit to bending to bending things and being a, a little too powerful than you had planned during um, testing. So one of these tricks that's still in the book is called erudite, and normally when you pause, you can only introduce one word into a pause. Mm-hmm. Erudite lets you pick out two words to add to a parse. So that increases the flexibility of a parse. Because normally you're only allowed one, now you're allowed two, so the options increase. Originally this was a very low tier trick, but it became a bit too hard for early people to play with the game. So I had to scale that back a bit, put some restrictions. But yeah, there's been tons of tricks that I've had to rework because they simply either worked too well or did not work at all. Um, forward, forward thinking was one of those. Like originally, I thought it'd be a super high-powered thing, but in the scheme of things, it, it only adds a little bit of information and didn't warrant being like a top-tier power. So there's been a lot of balancing that's been going on with these tricks. But I haven't encountered anything that broke the game. Being very careful about that, which I think I think now, is say, I think is saying a lot because isn't, because well part of the play te part of a play test is to find ways to break it. Yes, um, well I've let my players run loose. I've let people run loose on it, and nothing so far has been too far out of my expectations. A couple of things I said were underpowered, or some things were a little bit too much, which I have scaled back. But that's all part of QA. It's all part of testing, and now that I've said this, I can guarantee you that someone's going to find something that's completely game-breaking um, when it gets released. Because <laughs> that's the way of things. One, it is the way of things, but two, be very, 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 very careful about tempting the gods of irony. <laughs> Honestly, you can break the paths without the tricks anyways. Um, so... The magic system goes all the way from things you could achieve by hand to things that only a god could do. So, again, I expect this game was designed to be broken. But at the same time, since it's within the design scope, therefore it becomes not broken, I guess. You, if, it, if it's expected. You unbreak <laughs> it by breaking it. Exactly. Um, but it's usually done at the exchange of your coherency, your sanity. So you've only got so many times that you can do it before you lose control of your character. 
Which so that definitely that definitely makes sense. Um, mm. Now you've now you've meant you've mentioned um, that this about this going into um, about this going into kick into Kickstarter. Um, now, unless I'm, unless I'm mistaken, and I'll, let me let me double check because I don't think the Kickstarter has launched. It's it's not going to be launching and uh, for five days time, I think. Yeah, five days. Just had to just had oh, to six do, days something. Like that. Just had to uh, <laughs> double check. Um, how long do you foresee that Kickstarter running? I think we're going with the standard fare of 28 days or a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I, from memory, the target goal was like 5k, maybe a yeah. little bit less. And um, assuming assuming that you get that, how long do you do you foresee it um, taking for release? Do you see that happening um, first quarter 2021? Um, well, the books are already done, so I foresee it being as soon as we can get shipping out. <laughs> um, basically, I've I've worked very hard and very diligently, and before starting the Kickstarter, all of the content for the book has been completed. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get um, PDFs out um, maybe a couple of weeks after the Kickstarter is done, but I can't predict shipping, not with the current state of the world. Uh, now, obvious, obviously, when it came to that, I was fo I was focused more on um, digital than on fi than on physical right now, because I because if I had yeah. asked about physical, I knew where that was going to go. Yeah, um, but yeah, no, I the digital copies are pretty much ready. I might mm -hmm. just need to do a couple more proofreading runs, and then I can send them out. So we're all ready to go. Um. <laughs> And I'll and it's definitely something I'll be looking forward to, and I'll pro and I'll probably be highlighting that on the Kickstarter spotlight once it goes live, because I've already got it um, I've already got it bookmarked for when it does. Nice, thank you, thank you. Because, <laughs> well, as they as they say in Shogi, look a thousand moves ahead. Absolutely, um, yeah. So we'll be doing print on demand mm -hmm. uh, mostly. Like once the Kickstarter is over, you'll still be able to get the book. Um, I believe we're using drive through RPG, unless someone's told me, unless um, the publisher has changed um, the business scheme without telling me. So that's as far as I know, and we'll go with, and we're going with that until someone does says otherwise. <laughs> All right, and I'll I'll be keeping a close eye on how that develops. Oh, um, absolutely. Ho hopefully, I do well. Yeah. Um, just to make sure we don't tempt irony. Yes. There we go. Um, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to uh, come onto the show. And All good. Any anytime yep. you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around <laughs> here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Of course. And if somebody questions that, I can you can always say, "Well, it's five o'clock somewhere." <laughs> Especially in our case, it's, yeah. it's Australia and America, I assume. Uh -huh. So yeah. somewhere it's five o'clock between us. <laughs> and of course, this of course. Well, any anytime somebody asks me about the whole, about the whole, how can you drink? You're a monk. Um, what do you think? What do you think they do? And when you're when you're in a monastery in the middle of bumfuck nowhere. <laughs> Besides, there's ar there's already there's already pl there's already um sex like the Trappists in Belgium that brew their own beer. So why not? I mean, it's not strictly against uh, most religions to drink alcohol. Um, but yeah, I totally get it. Like, when there's nothing else, drink away. <laughs> yeah. Um, and just besides, you gotta you gotta do something to keep to keep people in to keep people inside the temple and um and f uh, free beer makes one hell of a sales pitch. <laughs> it does. It does. It does. A life of. Is it celibacy? Hmm. Are uh, all monks celibate? But yes, um, it, it's certainly the life. If you can just get free ba free boost, free bo free room, and free board. Yeah. Um. And of and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to to come onto the temple. And 
Uh, and um, there will be plenty. There will be plenty more insanity as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>